Good evening, everyone. How are you? Good. Good. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the Lord be with you. Let us take a moment to greet God. Lord Jesus, we come tonight for regeneration, renewal within, to regenerate ourselves as we commit ourselves to you in this parish, in our lives. We thank you, Jesus, for all the gifts we receive. We thank you for the pleasures of life that are good for us and that help us and encourage us. We thank you for the crosses we bear as well, for they bring us closer to you and understanding of the Paschal mystery of dying and rising as a Christian. And so therefore, Jesus, tonight we ask you, your sacred heart, to pour out your love, your divine mercy, your care and concern for all those here tonight in this church. We ask your blessing on the parish, on the pastors, the priests, that have said fiat to you and follow you. We ask your blessing especially on all young children and young adults who are searching and seeking you in life. We honor your mother Mary in our hearts, thanking her as patroness of this retreat and for assisting us to bring out the more gentle sides of ourselves the kindness we show, the meekness, and the beatitude of Anuim Yahweh, poor in spirit, humble enough to hear your word, to say yes to you, and to follow you in our lives. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Well, good evening to everybody. And let's wish that to each member of our community and all our guests and visitors here tonight. One and two. Sisters, I emphasize that joy so much because we need it in that world we live in uh, where we don't sense and see. We have 
joys that, you know, we go to a show or we go for dinner or we have a nice party. And that's a lot of joy, but it's so transient and it, it doesn't last. And the joy that the Lord wants us Christians to bring out of ourselves more, even in these times of hardship between the countries that we're seeing in the last couple of days, again, big goof-ups from the powers uh, of North Korea and all of that that's going on with the U.S. and it's a panic for a lot of people so we pray for all of them that they would find in their life conversion and let's talk a little bit about conversion for a couple of minutes. I promised Father Avi that I would touch upon it for you because of your great big celebration of a renewal tomorrow evening in this parish. So we could begin with just a, 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 a very simple word, uh, sentence that Jesus used uh, for us. He told us in John chapter 8, if the Son sets you free, you shall indeed be free. And so the liberation to our human psyche, that is our humanness, you know, our tendency to be um, at fault, to be sinners, to be weak, to be poor, all of us together. He comes to say, but if I set you free, you will be free indeed. You will be forgiven. You will now see your transformation slowly but surely in life no longer as something of a penance, but a penance that is a gift, that is a gift from God. Of time for the human, our Lord wants us to be human and that's why we're created that way. So we know there's lots of good in creation. We also know that our free will demands of us often to maybe not turn to God enough and to turn the other way. So conversion as we prepare for tomorrow night's celebration of reconciliation in this parish wants us to turn ourselves and focus more on God. And what are the things in my life that involve stopping and then proceeding? Am I discerning? Am I, am I looking at those areas of my life that perhaps perhaps are not moving me towards God and my family and friends, but moving me. Sin always is very selfish, as you know. Sin moves us into ourselves and our delights and what is good for us. And it is a very greedy, greedy thing, the sin, because it moves the person away from salvation to sin. And so conversion wants, in the Catholic Church anyway, for us to move away from sin and move towards salvation. From injustice in the world or the injustices that we create ourselves to uh, justice. From laxity or laziness or uh, religiously and so on to a fervor. And so we need joy in our lives to do such things. So as you prepare, remember Remember that conversion is also a cause for joy, and we see it in the prodigal son, for instance. We see it in many places in Scripture. For instance, in Luke chapter 15, but we had to rejoice and celebrate with joy because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. This fellow was lost and has been found. And then again in Luke, we see a very nice scripture to help us prepare for that sacrament. Luke 15, it says, there will be more joy, again, it's a joy, in heaven over one penitent, one sinner who repents, than 99 righteous people who think they are, who need or believe they need no repentance. You will find that in reading St. Luke's gospel. Why would I convert, Lord? Why would I have to change who I am? Well, because to be in relationship with God and my parish and parishioners, each one of us together, wherever we have come from or are, requires humility. Sin is very arrogant and proud-hearted. It loves to blame others. It does not like to take responsibility, does it? Of 
course not. It's hidden also. We like to hide it because we're afraid. And we saw that the other day in the scripture on Sunday where Adam and Eve, they didn't think they were naked. And naked can mean a lot of things here, but we won't go into that. But naked in the sense that trusting and loving God, we can be ourselves when we're in relationship with God. Even in our sinfulness, we come before him just before him. And we know of a loving Father who forgives us. And therefore, it's a requirement to Christian life. Conversion is not a once and for all thing. It's a, it's a life, ongoing life event. Uh, it's a, um, an order from God, and you will see that in Ezekiel, for instance, chapter 18. God will say, to the people, make yourself a new heart. In other words, a transfusion of the heart towards me. Transform your heart towards me. God sees in Ezekiel, and if you read it, everybody's running around doing their own thing. They don't know if they're coming or going, and it's all, uh, it's all uh, a mess. And uh, God <laughs> speaks to them saying, oh, again, you're trying to do it your way. It's not working. So make yourself a new heart. Lovely chapters in Ezekiel. The other, uh, the other thing is that conversion is um, our responsibility and God's responsibility because God will say again in Ezekiel chapter 36, for instance, I shall give you a new heart. Because you have sat down, in your soul you realize that you're human and that you need my grace to cooperate with the world even. We need that kind of thing, right? So I shall give you a new heart. In other words, it's a promise from God. So it's a command on one level, make yourself a new heart. So in other words, God is working and we're working. So we're cooperating, okay? So it's an effort on our part to cooperate with the one who says, I shall give you a new heart. So why would we go through all this and tomorrow night a big thing going on probably and priests coming from all over and, and uh, our people gathering together? Well, again, it's because we need a new heart. It's a, a, a very special re regeneration of the soul during the 40 days and 40 nights. And so we need to encounter God in the sacrament. We need it. And we need to know that prayer will bring about this conversion. And prayer, that what I mean there, is the relationship we have at this time with God to deepen it in building community. And so I think that's enough for conversion, and you've been hearing it all your life like I have, but it's always new when we look at it as God invites us and we cooperate. That there is in my life many areas perhaps, meaning us, where, you know, I could get better at things. And it can be very simple and it can be very beautiful as well. So you might want to have a little bit of a look at that for tomorrow night's preparation during the day to see what would be good for you at this time. So let's take a moment of silence. Close your eyes, please. And let's go inside. Breathing in through the nostrils. New life. And exhaling through the mouth the toxins of our day. We do that a few times to relax and focus on the Lord.
So brothers and sisters, remaining in prayer and silence for a moment within you, breathing in slowly, we spoke and opened up with it's a joy. It is a joy, Lord, to belong to you. It's a joy. And it's a joy to have parish. And so to increase our capacity for joy, let's just have a few things that I'll throw out and maybe you would like to think about them as you prepare f during your Lenten season. Lord, we really desire joy in a world where there's so little of it at times and where there is none of it without you. To increase our joy tonight, Lord, there are certain, certain things during this very holy and gifted season that we all need to think about to increase our joy. Perhaps it is resentment. Maybe I need to give up resentment so as to be more forgiving to others. I might want to give up hatred if I have it in my heart in any way and return good to that person instead of evil. Perhaps I like to complain about everything and drive everybody else crazy. Maybe I could give up some complaining if that's in my life and be more grateful to you. If I tend to bring pessimistic attitudes to others, perhaps I could become more hopeful to them. Giving up worrying will bring about more trusting you. Giving up my anger, because it just sits there and becomes like a hard rock within my gut. Giving it up so as to be freed, like you tell us in John chapter 8, and become more patient. And perhaps I have to stop and to give up giving up. Perhaps I give up too easy. Perhaps I don't have that perseverance I need, that strength that you're with me to move on no matter what. Maybe I need to hang in there more, in my parish, for instance, in the community. Whatever we need to give up or wherever we're sinning is an occasion for us to find joy. And to find joy, we need to pause, to stop, to turn things around during Lent, and then to proceed in a more loving way. We know, God, that as you prepare us tonight and as you prepare us during Lent, your joy will be complete in us when we turn to you, and then we can trust again even though we've been let down by so many that we trusted perhaps in life, we know with you, you will never, ever forsake your child. And so glory be to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And we take a deep breath in through the nostrils and out through the mouth, bringing in that new joy, new life, and expiring all that is not good for us through the mouth. When you get to your wit's end, you know what I mean? When you just have had it up to. When you get to your wit's end, remember now, from now on, you'll find God lives there. God is with you there. So. Be encouraged and patient with yourself. If you're finding that God is your co-pilot, remember this, swap seats. You can't control it. 
Men and women have been trying this since creation. We cannot control. And that's why it's dangerous for me to be in leadership, and I know it. It's dangerous for anybody in leadership because of our human tendencies. We should wish nothing, nothing, Lord, but to just be. And then if we have to take it on, we take it on with joy. And we make sure that we take it on only if we can create some joy for those we'll serve. And leadership must be service, not control. So if there's any pilots, and God's the co-pilot, it will not work in parish. I don't know why some people change churches either. I meet them all the time. Oh, Father, I didn't like the priest, or I didn't understand him, or I this, or I that. And that's a, you've all heard that too. We all hear that. And sometimes maybe it's a good thing. I don't know. I don't know. Is it good to move to the next way, place? Because I don't know why some people change churches all the time. There's some that are just doing shopping, or what are they doing? <laughs> it's the same sacrament. Anyway, what difference does it make, I tell them, because it doesn't make any difference which one you stay home from. <laughs> Those kinds are shopping all over the place. Man, I'm, but they're not committed. So their church can become the mall. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really matter. They're looking. They keep looking. And Jesus tells us, look no more. He tells the apostles. He tells the disciples all over the place. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we seek that kind of a God. Now, I'd like to ask you a question. And I'd like to just that you would feel free to just speak here. You're in safety and security. If you were stranded on a tropical island, that would be nice for a while. If you were stranded, though, on a tropical island, got it? What two things would you want with you? Think about it. If you were stranded on a tropical island, what two things would you want with you? A Bible and a rosary. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's fantastic. A Bible and a rosary. Okay, anybody else? You're stranded now. You're stranded. Yes, 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 please. Uh, the l l young lady beside you there. Yes. What did you say? Your MP3? <laughs> a lighter and a fishing rod. Okay, let's put that in, in the, the basket there. What else do we got? A boat. Huh? A boat. A boat. Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> How you'd carry a boat, I don't know, but uh, yeah, a good, we need a boat. Pardon? God and, the Bible. God and the Bible would get us through, right? Anything else? God and my family. A toothbrush and toothpaste. <laughs> okay, anything else? Wisdom and? Courage. Wow, no kidding, eh? Oh, yes. We have many needs. We are stranded if we do not have the Lord, right? Then we are like on a tropical island, not because we're in Calgary or Winnipeg and it's cold in winter. <laughs> but we are stranded without the captain, the pilot. We're stranded in life. And I want you to look at that for a preparation tomorrow night. In which, in which ways do you feel you're without God? Stranded. Problem somewhere there that's just eating at you. What, what, how do you get, for, what do you need? You're adults and you're young adults and you know what you need. You need to go inside. And that's why we have retreats. We pull back and we look inside. 
What is it that I need for more joy in my life? What are the things that are stranding me, if you like, and going nowhere with it? You might want to think of that island, tropical island, though, and going there someday, but make sure it's WestJet or Air Canada or something like that so you can get back. But we're, a lot of people that I've met, and you have met them too, women and men, and priests and nuns and bishops and popes and the whole bit, we're human. Things have happened to us. And we can feel stranded at times in a way that is inexplicable. And it can hold us and make us ill, very ill. And we know those things can be freed up because we have a merciful Father. So whatever, if there's any of that, don't stay stranded. Ask yourself the question, what two items do I need right now that are going to free me so that I will be crossing the bridges anywhere in my soul that I want to? That I'll be free like Jesus promises in John 8. If the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. So anyway, I was speaking with a grade six class about the Lord and how they were doing their homework and how well it was being done. And one little boy just stood up and said, well, I'll tell you what, Father, my mother taught me to appreciate a job well done. She used to say, if you're going to kill each other, do it outside. I just finished cleaning the house. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? It's true too, isn't it? I'll give you a few more of that. I thought it was kind of fun to bring that up. And at the same time, we think of our dear moms and dads, our first teachers, eh? Another little girl said to me, uh, we asked about religion. Like, what is religion? And how are you living religion? And they're small, eh? And she just stood up and said, my mother taught me religion, because we were speaking about not the teachers at school, we were speaking about the first people that teach us, and that's usually our parents, right? So my mother taught me religion. She said, you better pray that that mess will come out of my carpet. <laughs> you like that? Oh, yeah, I do. Oh, you know, there's nothing nicer for a priest to visit a Catholic school the young ones, especially with the teachers. The things they come out with with religion is unbelievably beautiful and so practical. A little boy stood up and he said, well, Father, my father taught me about tra time travel. I said, oh, yeah, you're watching that on TV lately? He said, no, but my dad said, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next year. <laughs> Some of you in the 40s and up will remember that, right? They never did, and they never wanted to. But they had to stop us from behaving the way we behaved at times, right? And a father in a good dad he always teaches good logic. He'll say things like, because I said so, that's why. <laughs> There's logic. You can go to university and study logic all the time. You can go to a, a daddy and he'll say, I'll teach you logic. I said so. Do it. So, brothers and sisters, one more I've got to tell you. This is a little grade five. And uh, his father told me this story. That when he was just very, very young, maybe four years old, his dad took him to church for the first time. And he went on a day when a guy like me, who talks a long time, um, was giving a retreat in the parish, okay? So his first visit was not only the mass and the homily by the local pastor, they also had a missionary priest in for retreats, so they had to, he had to speak. So anyway, the little boy was pretty good, you know, and he's sitting by his father, and dad a couple of times said, just, it won't be long, just, just wait, it'll, it'll be okay. Because he was pulling at dad's jacket. And then anyway, he was sitting there and listening to this guy going on and on, and what does a great uh, child of four years old, they, they need to dance and move around the church and not be sitting too much like that because it's, it just doesn't work, does it? So anyway, 
After a while, he was like getting really antsy, this little guy. And all of a sudden, from the pew, about where you're sitting, he saw the red candle, perpetual light, by the Blessed Sacrament. And he knew enough to say to his dad, Dad, you see that light over there? Well, when it turns green, can we go? <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes, eh? When it turns green, can we go? Let's stand for a moment. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we've looked at many things, and I just want to touch on one more uh, to help the parish realize their vision, their objective, etc. So we cannot build a parish alone. We need to understand the scriptures on giftedness and how the early church built was with the men and women of the time in union with Christ now, building and sharing prayer and breaking bread like we do, and all the things that we attempt to do, they were doing in the early church. And so we need to touch that, and yet it's such a complex and it's such a simple message, but it's complex because it requires much more than a few minutes. But I really felt in prayer today, Lord, what would they need? And I'm just going with that kind of trust, because there's lots about building, right? So, having said that, Giftedness is very important. We see it all over the scriptures. One that I'd like to share with you comes from Romans chapter 12. And if you have, can remember that, chapter 12, 1 to 21. Okay, but I'm not going to read that many. I just want to touch on it. Just as each of our bodies has several parts and each part has a separate function, so all of us Christians, okay, in union with Christ, form one body and as parts of it belong to each other. So baptismal commitment means that we belong to each other. Our gifts differ according to the grace given. Not everybody can be a bookkeeper. Not everybody's good in math. Not everybody's good in carpentry. Not everybody's good in, 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 and that's what God is trying to say. According to the grace given to each. So whatever grace it is, it will go on in that chapter to say whatever it is, use it for the Lord. Use what you have been given. So I invite you to close your eyes for a moment and to take a deep breath. And in building parish community, Lord Jesus, what are my gifts? What are the gifts you have given to me for building up, not only in my family, not only in society, not only in the world, but for you, Lord? What do I have that I can glorify you with? What have you given me I want you to think about it in silence for a few moments, for the building up of our parish. What do you believe is in you unique qualities that need to be given back to God for the building up of the church on earth? What are those gifts? Name five of them. I'm sure you have dozens, but at least one. What do you have you know God has given you that is super special and could help build wherever you are. Harmony, love, forgiveness. It can help build women, men who are desperate or suffering. What is it in you as a man or woman that you know you can give to your parish and you're giving back to God what God has given you? What are some of those things? I leave you in prayer for that.
continuing on with giftedness, we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, for instance. Now I want to clear up a wrong impression, it says, about spiritual gifts. <laughs> okay. There are a variety of gifts, but always the same spirit. There are all sorts of services to be done in the parish, but always the same Lord that we do it for. Working in all sorts of different ways, different giftedness, right? In different people because everybody's got different gifts and that's when they're brought to the church. That's how we've built from the first century is the women and men who have brought their gifts in service to be done. Always the same Lord, working in all sorts of ways, it says. The same God, working in all of them. So one may have the gift of preaching, another one may have the gift of the Spirit, another may, and they go on preaching, instruction, teaching. All of these gifts in Corinthians, always remembering. These are spiritual gifts. And even all the gifts electricians can have be a spiritual gift. Does that make any sense? Yes, it does. When they understand two other levels of giftedness. And so let's look at that. Again, we close our eyes. What are the gifts found in my parish? What do I see operating right now within Ascension Parish? What are some of the gifts we have that we've seen clearly as a group? Name those gifts to the Lord in your heart. Whatever you see that you see as a person giving their gift, pray for that person now. That God will give them the strength to serve Him with what they have. What is that gift that you see in the parish and gifts that you could pray for a moment for these people. of giftedness, the spirituality of giftedness, we can look to the Lord. The Lord Jesus knew, knew that we would be gifted by the Holy Spirit, right? We know that. And the Holy Spirit will give gifts, and some people will spend their life never believing they had one. That's so sad. And that's when we get into the sin of envy and jealousy and all of that junk. But when we believe in the scriptures, then we believe God has gifted us, then we look to Jesus who was confident because of the Father. We look to Jesus who saw himself as a vital opening for others, an opening. Finally, a people will be freed from sin and death. Jesus called himself the gate, the door, the shepherd, the vine, the light of this world, he would say, I came to light the way. Jesus was encouraging us in many ways in the scripture, what about you? What do you believe I could give you? What are the aspects of gift giftedness that you would believe so much and in a humble way, like our Lord, serve humanity? And in particularly on this retreat, in our parish. Well, let's look at three things. 
and I'll just touch upon them, and I'm sure you know them already. There are three levels of giftedness we could look at. The first one is the word ultimate. Ultimate, and I, I've summarized this for you. The ultimate gift that we received. What do you think that is, somebody? Holy Spirit. Prayer. Prayer. Life. Love. Sure, these are part of the ultimate gift. But what do you believe is the ultimate gift? You'll find it in John 3.16. What is it? Jesus. Thank you. That's the ultimate. That, what are we here for tonight? Isn't it because of him? Of course. And we know that. And so we're called to the ultimate gift. We're, not, we're spiritual beings because of our soul, touched by God and baptized, right? Our body is used for the mission, whatever it is on earth. The soul's eternal in God. The body dies and then becomes just ashes, dust, but the soul lives on. So spiritual beings like ourselves and believing that, we're just spiritual beings having an earthly experience. We're going somewhere. Those who believe just in an earthly experience, that's okay if that's what they want to do. But where are they going? Or do they care? You see, you care. This is your parish and you prove it that you care. You care about other spiritual beings on earth because the Lord called us to spirituality, to deepen our love for God and relationship and to deepen it by giving himself God so loved the world that he gave his only son. There is your ultimate gift. Okay, without staying too long on it, because I don't want to tire you, is another level of building community. Why the ultimate? We focus then on the ultimate goal of eternity in God. The second level, uh, very important, is another level of giftedness. And I'll call it the basic gift. What do you think is a basic gift? Did someone say self? Thank you. Oh, yeah, I want to hear you. What? Hope. This young fella here, how old are you? Nine years old, eh? Isn't that nice to hear from a nine-year-old? Wonderful. Anything else? The basic gift. Courage, love. Courage lo all of those things are basic gifts. Uh, in the, in the, the second level of giftedness here, though, just so you know, and I'll get to it, is that it's, uh, we work on those things. Virtue? Beautiful. So let's just, ultimate gift, the reason we do what we do, Jesus. The basic gift and something that's so complex is you and I. We're the basic gift. We don't see it. Precious sings it to you. You are precious to my heart, says God, and I love you. So we're a gift. And we can be not such a gift at times. <laughs> I tell you about a, a parish in Vancouver, one of the... I got, went often to BC, eh? so I got to know a lot of Italian people. And uh, one night we were at, at a parish up in North Vancouver by Grouse Mountain, nice place to be. And uh, we preached about um, the giftedness of the spirit and so on. Anyway, so after this really madame, Italian, a real lady, she comes up to me and she says, Father, 
<laughs> just her whole presentation, you'd have loved her. She was like a little bit sarcastic, a little bit, you know, but comical and with a big, big heart. She said, this is my husband. Trust me, Father, he's not always such a gift. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So let's, let's remember that. Basic gift is you. When, it, when following the Christ, we become part of that Holy Spirit giftedness, okay? When we're not, we can be the opposite of our giftedness. We can decide to hold my giftedness to me. I'm not going to share it, and it's got nothing to do with anybody else, and I'm going to enjoy every minute of it alone. There's a lot of people in the world like that, right? But there are millions and billions like yourselves, giving of yourselves as moms and dads, your basic gift to nurture and love your child. You're giving the best. You're persevering with husband and wife at times. Not easy. This is when the person has prayer, has that. Their basic gift is truly a gift. And then we have another form, and the last one, and the least important, actually, but important, because without it, we don't do anything. And we call this particular gifts. So name me some particular gifts. I thank you, by the way, for responding, because I, I don't mind just preaching retreats, but I love when there's community action. It's nice. So um, what do you think are particular gifts? Carpentry. Singing. Huh? Singing. 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 Preaching. 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 What was the last couple? Service. They were Service. Oh, my goodness. Beautiful. <laughs> I keep reaching out to you. <laughs> Particular gifts, a ballerina, a symphony orchestra, a painter, a lawyer, a doctor who heals us, a lawyer who is just and honest, an accountant, a teacher, a principal. These are all particular gifts, but that's not who you, the person is. That's what they do. If they have the ultimate gift with them, Jesus, if they know that they're a gift even though they're a sinner, they know they're going to fail, but they're, they're just in themselves. They know they're poor, and they know they want to follow then they become those teachers we need, those doctors we need, those nurses we need, They're the electricians we need. They're not always looking at, oh, well, you know, I'm making uh, $75 a minute now. <laughs> eh? Oh, gee, well, lucky you. I'm not making that in, in 10 days, so cause that's good. But I, all I needed you to do is tell me that I needed some more electricity that would work, whatever. See, it's our attitude of being. It's the way we interpret our strengths. And God wants us to make all the money. In the, it's to not prefer it and to never take advantage of another. How do Catholics learn that too in a world that's teaching us the exact opposite? Get everything you can for yourself and forget the next one. That's not our teaching, and you know it, and I know it. So we are always constantly giving thanks to God for whatever particular gift you have that you could give back, give back. Not, and don't be a doormat. You have to make a living. But giftedness in the church is very important from the beginning of the church right in the first, first years after the resurrection of Jesus. It was natural to give back. They had their Lord. They focused on the ultimate, as you know in the scriptures. They knew 
They experienced a love they never thought was possible. The early church suffering, focusing, falling down, getting, getting challenged by the, the apostles and so on and so forth. They just kept going because of the ultimate gift. And they knew that they were a gift because Jesus held them, forgave them, healed them, taught them a new way, taught, him, taught them about his father. No longer will you say father, you will say our father. I give you my father. I give you my life. I give you my death so that I will rise for you. I will give you the ultimate gift back to you, me. Jesus. And you then will understand that you too are a gift when you're in me. We saw the scripture last night, Father, that they may be one, you in them and me in you, he said. You see? And then whatever you're going to use, you break bread. Not only at the table here, but you break bread by handing out the bulletins, by singing here, all of the beautiful ministries. You are living the giftedness, brothers and sisters. Pray on it. Pray on that. Don't be afraid. Don't let this become a retreat of the past. Whatever is good here tonight or the last few nights, just meditate on that for yourself. Because I like to say a retreat begins when the retreat master leaves. Because he's just there to give out the stuff. That's important, but more important is your pastors and yourselves are left here to build and to continue building in the ultimate gift of the Father, Jesus, to us. Jesus in line with us, always in communication together through the sacraments, through the scriptures, through the rosary, through all of your devotions, whatever you do, you realize your gift and your giftedness as a human being is priceless and therefore we are able then to use our gifts, whether they be teaching or doctoring or music or singing or dancing, to bring something of joy to the world today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in giving thanks to our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. the kingdom Amen. Allow yourself to feel that silence again and that joy for a moment as the Spirit wants us to believe in the ultimate gift deeper than ever, our Lord Jesus Christ. The gift you are in following Him and with your knowledge, your talents, serving the Lord in our parish and in the world today. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God, in God's love and mercy, bless you abundantly at Ascension Parish, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.